Welcome to Bible Believers Fellowship and the ministry of BBFOhio.com as we begin a two-part message titled, The Implications of the Resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you know of any unsaved people who would be willing to watch or listen to this message, we would strongly urge you to do what you can to get them near the radio as this program airs, or send them the link to watch the video or the link to our Sermon Audio MP3 download online. This message was preached to the local church body here in Worthington, but the implications discussed will bring the lost sinner under the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and God's word will not return void. So we know that any lost sinner listening to this message will come under the convicting power of the Spirit of God. Before going to our study, we want to share this letter from Sister Catherine, who writes from Cleveland, Ohio. Catherine wrote in response to our two-part message titled, The Satanic Nature of Same-Sex Marriage, and that was preached during a two-week period and aired during that two-week period in which liberal and apostate churches were promoting same-sex marriage in the churches in the state of Ohio. Catherine writes, quote, as an Ohio resident, I was subjected to, quote unquote, the conversation over the weekend. I didn't realize what was going on until I heard your sermon and did some checking afterward. I found out my family member belongs to a liberal church like those you described, which are participating. Let me tell you something. It has been a lonely road sticking up for true biblical Christianity in this culture. It has been an especially shunning experience to tell your liberal family you are both pro-life and a Christian conservative who follows the King James Bible and rejecting what the world says. I will take my shunning and persecution with a severely contrite heart in my precious Jesus name. And to that we say amen, Sister Catherine. And we thank God for believers like her we are very encouraged by these letters we receive from those of you who stand with us in these dark times. Yes, they are dark times in this nation, but each one of you who stand for the biblical gospel of Jesus Christ while standing up for biblical morality and truth are a light in the darkness, and the darker the darkness, the brighter your light shines. And may God bless each one of you as we now begin our study of the implications of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is part one of two of the crucifixion and the burial and resurrection, and there's nothing wrong with that. And we've done that before here. But there's also churches that'll get together and they'll use the resurrection like it's some kind of a mythical story, and they'll try to find some moral lesson about it. And uh, I don't know if I mentioned in the previous messages or not, but I've gone, and uh, when I wasn't pastoring, I've gone to other churches visiting with friends and family on uh, Easter Sunday, and I've heard some horrendous uh, messages. One uh, was how the resurrection, whether you believed it or not, didn't matter. The important thing was that you understood that it's sort of like a cocoon, and you come out of trials in life like a beautiful butterfly. And they had pictures of butterflies all over the... the and that's not the message here. Um, yes, God will take you through your trials and He'll work all things together for good to those who love Him and are the called according to His purpose. Amen? Amen. But the message of the resurrection is God came to pay for your sins. Amen. And he successfully did it, and the resurrection proves it. Amen. And then there's some final implications we're going to look at as we go through this, these texts. The bottom line is, this is an historic event. This is not um, like the story of Thor or um, Zeus or any of the pagan gods or anything like that. Those were... Um, for the most part, not all of it, a lot of it was based in truth, but it was, it was in um, mythologized. Uh, Jesus was crucified. Now in another study, we looked at the historic evidence for that, but the historic evidence starts in the fact that 
the Bible itself is an historic document, and the Bible itself is a proven historic document. And what we have today are a lot of self-appointed scholars who run around telling everybody that you can't really trust the Bible. They're doing that because they have an, a vested interest in teaching that. They reject Jesus Christ, so they have to lie about the Bible and tell people it's not historically accurate so that they can soothe their conscience. Because if that book is true, those people are lost and on their way to hell. Yeah. You always have to ask the question, when someone tells you something, what's in it for them? It's like you, you see these TV preachers and they're always preaching that seed faith offering. What's in it for them? Plenty. New cars, new houses, nice clothes, jets. Yeah. But when a man stands up here and preaches how that Christ died for your sins in 1 Corinthians 15.3, he's preaching a message that doesn't benefit him at all. It's all about Jesus and you. So that's when you know you're sitting under a real preacher is when he emphasizes what Jesus has already done for you and that you haven't a thing to do with it. Amen. So look at verse 3. We've got it on the board here if you want to turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In verse 3, Paul wrote a letter to real human beings in a place, a city called Corinth over in Greece. And he wrote them this letter to tell them certain things and among them to remind them that when he visited them in person, he says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Amen. A real historic event, just as real as 9-11 just as real as your birthday. It happened. He died on a cross. And when it says according to the scriptures, get this, prophets 2,000 years before Jesus was born, prophets told you it was going to happen. Amen. That's what it means, according to the scriptures. Amen. Now think about that. <coughs> You got some guy over in the Middle East in 2000 BC prophesying that a Messiah is going to come and he's going to die. Then you got, you got in 1000, around 1000-ish BC, Psalms are written like Psalm 22. And he says, they pierced my hands and my feet. The Messiah is prophesying through the psalmist. They pierced. They didn't even do that in 1000 BC. They weren't crucifying people yet. And the prophets were telling you, he's going to be pierced through his hands and his feet. <clears throat> then about 500 years later, Isaiah, he prophesies in Isaiah 53 that the Messiah would be wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon Him by whose stripes we are healed. Said He would be so uh, beaten to the point where He'd be unrecognizable and there'd be no beauty that we should desire Him. How did He know that 500 years before Jesus was even born? I'll tell you how. There's a God in heaven. And that God in heaven spoke through the prophets to tell you that Jesus would come. Christ, that word Christ, you see that? That's from Christos, Greek, but it's Hamashiach, Hebrew, Messiah, same word. And the prophets were telling you that Messiah would come and he would be rejected by his own people, the Jews, and Jesus was. That he would be crucified. He even, this is, the psalmist even talked about how they would uh, cast lots for his garments, which happened to Jesus. The psalmist said in Psalm 22 that they would walk by him on the cross and they would shake their fists and they would wag their heads and they would say, come down. He saved himself, or he, he saved others. Let's see him save himself. How, a thousand years before Jesus was born, how did they know that was going to happen? It's all according to the Scriptures. That's a real place in Israel and you can fly over there and see it. 
And right up on top of that is where Jesus was crucified. The place of the skull. Golgotha. It's a real place. A real event happened there. Then it says in verse 4, 1 Corinthians 15, read that. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Now that's good news. Amen. I mean, if it had stopped and he was buried. Ooh. You know they've made movies about Jesus and they stop it at the burial? Do you know Thomas Jefferson hacked up the Bible and stopped it at the burial? Yeah. Did you know that? Yeah. There's, a, there's all kinds of efforts to keep Jesus buried. <laughs> and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. The, the, in the book of Acts, Peter quoted the psalmist who said, you will not leave your Holy One, you will not leave my soul in hell. He rose from the dead and the prophets said He would. Amen. Thousands of years before He lived. And there's His tomb. You can hop on a jet and fly over there and you can walk in there and you won't find a body. And they even went in and did tests for decay of human remains. No decay. Just like the psalmist said, His body would not decay. He would be buried and He would rise from the dead without corruption. Now, you explain to me, you explain to me this. How is there a tomb in a place where tombs are scarce that has never had a dead body in it? Nobody ever dared put a dead body in that tomb. You want to know why? Because they've known since it happened who was laying in that tomb Amen. and who came out of it. And even the most brazen, Christless person never dared try to put a dead body in that tomb. It sits there as a testament. And the world ignores it. There's a lot of Christians who fly over there and there's a lot of sightseers who will go by and look at it. But the world acts like it didn't happen. It's a real place. Brother Mike Kaler can tell you he's been there. Come walking out of it. We got pictures. And it, I, I don't know that I'll ever make it over there uh, in this lifetime, but I'm going to go there one day. Amen, brother. <laughs> we'll talk more about that some other time. So you have the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, if it's a true Christian church, then today, of all days, they should be talking about this. Amen. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And these events are detailed in the four Gospels. If you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that is the climax of those four Gospels, is how that Christ died, and He was buried, and He rose again. And then we see the ascension into heaven, and He's promised to return. And I just want to mention this, third and free of charge. I was telling Jenny that uh, I'd heard this years ago and kind of just forgotten about it. But if you read the Gospel accounts, when Jesus w was resurrected, have you noticed how that, I believe it's in John, where it says that they folded, Jesus folded the napkin that was over His face and His body. He folded it and left it neatly. Yeah. You notice that? Yeah. You ever wonder about that? And if you study Middle Eastern master-servant relationships, when the master folded his napkin and got up from the table, maybe go to the restroom or whatever, the servant knew he was coming back. Wow. Now if he just thrown the napkin down on the table, it's time to clean up. But when Jesus left, he folded the napkin and said, I'll be back. Amen. 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 A book of fiction doesn't put that kind of detail in there, by the way. For, and doesn't even explain it. Just leaves it there. It's an amazing... Now, we're not going to go through this chart, but we've charted these main points from the Gospels to show you something that we don't make a big deal about, but we want you to know the facts. This is historic. It's not make-believe. Um, you know, I love chocolate bunnies <laughs> just as much as the next person. But this little rodent 
<laughs> doesn't have anything to do with the resurrection. So I've started a ministry, and if any of you have any of these, bring them to me, and uh, I will dispose of them for you. But we're not going to go around condemning people for having chocolate bunnies or anything like that. But we do want to keep the focus on the real reason for the season. <laughs> and we also want to be factual about it. It's like Christmas. You know, don't make a big deal about the fact he was probably born around September 18th and not December 25th. And um, there weren't just, we don't know that there were three wise men. You remember we've talked about this. It doesn't say three. So there's a lot of fictional things that get splashed into the truth. So you've got to be careful about that. <coughs> And one of the fictional things is Good Friday. That's why we don't come over here on Friday night and have a candlelight service and chant. <laughs> oh. He was crucified three days and three nights before he resurrected. Now, I'm no mathematician, but I can count to three. <laughs> and I can tell you, Friday to Saturday is one day. Saturday to Sunday is two days. You can't get three out of that. <laughs> Happy Easter Monday? No. The Bible says he was crucified on Nisan 14. Did you know that? That's the actual Jewish date of his crucifixion. And if you go to 30 AD and look at your calendar, that was a Wednesday. Wednesday night, he was buried right before sunset. And so then you have all day Thursday and all day Friday and all day Saturday, and he rose right after sundown Saturday. Because that's the way the Jews count days. They start from the sunset to sunset. Amen. And so he rose from the dead Sunday morning, but it could have been by Gentile reckoning. You know, we would have been like uh, last night. <laughs> You know, because if it happened at 4 a.m., what do you tell people? Well, last night I woke up with a stomach ache. What time was it? 4 a.m. Well, it was actually not last night. It was this morning. You see what I'm saying? So you've got to be careful how you, you know. But if you look at this chart, you see that he died in the ninth hour, which began at dawn. The day begins at dawn. And so the ninth hour would be 3 p.m. Sometime between 3 p.m. and 6 p.m., or dusk, he was buried. Amen. And that's when the countdown uh, began and continued. And we won't go through it. And I don't have copies of this chart, but it's available on our website. F just print it. At bbfohio.com, we have a bunch of charts there you can print. And you can see then he rose um, the third day between dusk and dawn, three days and three full nights. So if you study the Bible, one of the biggest problems you're going to have is all the nonsense that you hear out here that isn't in the Bible. It's like, I've heard, you know, you, you watch, um, uh, what was the name of the uh, movie? Um, yeah, da, 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 If I were a rich man. Huh? Fiddler on the roof. Yeah. And the rabbi was walking around and uh, following, uh, what's his name, the, the main character that sang and did the song, huh? Was that Peter Ustinov? No. But what was his name in the movie? Uh, I can't the dad. That just showed today. It did. But anyway, he would say something to the rabbi. He'd say, the good book says. And the rabbi said, that's not in the good book. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the way people are. You know, kids, you ought to clean your rooms because cleanliness is next to godliness. That's not in the Bible, but people say, you know, the Bible says... Cleanliness is next to godliness. No, it doesn't say that actually. Uh, godliness uh, is, is good. Cleanliness is good, but they, that, that phrase isn't in the Bible. What are some of the others that we were talking about the other day? Uh, yeah, that's not in the Bible. Ben Franklin, yeah. What, poor Richard. <laughs> so that's one of the things you read in the Bible and you're constantly saying, wait a minute, I didn't know that was in there. And other times people say, oh yeah, the Bible says, how many of you heard this? The Bible says in the last days the seasons will change. That's what you know in the last days. It's not in the Bible. That doesn't say that. It says that the Antichrist, when he comes, he will seek to change times and seasons. It, it doesn't have anything to do with the weather. And, but that's what you hear. So you'll be in the Bible and say, wait a minute. And so we always have to do that. Well, we have to do that with this. 
And that's what I'm telling you is the Bible is a true document. The problem is people have messed it up. And Christianity has all this right before their eyes, and so many of them really just ignore it. But like any other historical event, there's a date. Nissan 14, 3790 AM, and that's not a radio station. That AM is Anamundi, which is uh, reckoned from the creation of the world in Jewish lunar solar calendar years. So in Nissan 14, 3790, according to Jewish calendar, or we would say Wednesday, April 3rd, 30 AD. Amen. A real event. Amen. It happened. Just like the 4th of July. We don't celebrate the 4th of July. It's a, the Easter Sunday thing. Easter, if we're talking about the resurrection, couldn't land on a Sunday every day. The 4th of July, let's say the, in 1776, let's say it was on a Friday, it's not going to be on a Friday every year. You see that? I was born on a Thursday. My birthday isn't on Thursday every year. So the Easter Sunday thing is just silly. But it's convenient. It's convenient, and that's why they do it, really. So let's stick to the truth, but you know, when people do this stuff, I, I don't major in it, but if someone wants to know the truth, you ought to know that and share it with them. Now let's look real quickly, the first implication of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If Jesus rose from the dead, then He is exactly who He said He was. Amen? Amen? Amen. It doesn't matter what your professor in your college or your seminary says. It doesn't matter what Mamma and Papa says. It doesn't even matter what your mom and dad says. It doesn't matter what you say. Amen. <clears throat> Jesus is who He said He was. And He claimed to be God. Amen. That's where the Trinity comes in, that the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, God is all places at all times. He's not stuck in heaven. And God, as Father in heaven, sent His Son, God the Son, in Jesus to die for our sins. Now, there's all kinds of references for that. And uh, 1 Timothy 3.16 uh, says, God was manifest in the flesh. And uh, other passages clearly point to Jesus being God. But I wanted to show you one real important one. And that is, John 8, 58. Jesus was being pressed by the uh, Pharisees and He said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Now, to a Gentile who doesn't really know the Bible, you're like, I am too. No, you've never looked at anybody and just said, I am. You've said, I am Greg, I'm here. I was born this date and I'm here now. This is a statement of timelessness. Amen. This is a statement saying that He always is. Amen. And that goes back to Exodus 3.14 when Moses, you remember the burning bush thing? God said to Moses, Moses was saying, who do I say sent me? God said to Moses, I am that I am. And He said, thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. Jesus sent Moses. Jesus is I am. Jesus came as a baby in human form, but His ex existence predates because He's eternal. Amen. Always has been, always will be. We said this before, I'll say it again. Dark matter, dark energy, People who say that are in the dark because they're godless. They reject the Bible. There's no such thing. Dark energy, dark matter, they're going to find out it's Jesus. The Bible says, by Him all things consist. So they've done their math and they figure there's something out there that's holding everything together. No one's ever seen dark matter. No one's ever seen dark energy. But they'll believe in that instead of Jesus. That's religion. If you believe in something you've never seen, something you really can only hypothesize exists, that's your religion. Amen. I'll believe in the Creator and that Jesus is the power by whom all things consist. Because when He returns, it says by the word of His mouth, everything's just going to melt. 
When Jesus returns, He's going to speak. And everything that's not glorified will melt. The only way to be glorified is to be saved by His offer of salvation and to receive His glorified Spirit in you. See? He is the I Am. He's the Eternal One. When you receive His Spirit, you receive the Spirit of I Am. And you become eternal and glorified. Oh